All right, guys, welcome back. Podcast number 65. Um, ben and I talked about, we. I think we just put 64 out, so um, we are definitely caught up with them, and we're trying to do uh, more of these more regularly. Um, just as a... As a effect of the times, I suppose um, we have been Brent and I have been brainstorming along with the other guys here um, on what's the best way we can help. Uh, we've all agreed, and we all have concluded that you know the more information we can provide, the better. Um, so we've got several different things that we're working on right now, and podcasts are not new to us, but um, we're going to put our foot on the pedal on them, I think, and, and try to continue to pump them out. Um, this one we're going to talk about, we talked about it a little bit in our last podcast, last, yes, was it yesterday or the Monday. day before? Monday. So today's Wednesday. So Monday we filmed one and recorded it um, outside, and we were actually making maple syrup at the time. Um, I had brought home um, like 15 gallons of sap from the weekend. Um, up north we had a nice run uh we had cold temperatures we had 20s at night and 40s in the afternoon and in um, a real short period of time there i ended up with an extra 15 gallons of sap and i didn't want to waste it um and so we brought it home and ben and i boiled it down on monday and made syrup out of it and so we talked a little bit about that and we recorded a podcast while we were doing it we were thinking about doing a syrup podcast at that point uh, but we ran out of time, and um, I jumped on a conference call, and, and we had we weren't able to get it done. <clears throat> now, we're going to talk about syrup today. And so uh, get yourself something, a warm cup of coffee or a glass of water, because this one might last a little while. Uh, this is a uh, this is like story time with Uncle Jer. Um, if you know me, you know I, I sometimes get into t- telling stories and storytelling. Um, I enjoy it. Uh, I, I am known to be a bit of a talker, so I, I like I like that kind of stuff. Um, I also really enjoyed this, I'm going to call it a process, and, and I had a buddy of mine, I think I talked about this in the last podcast, I had a buddy of mine that I talked to earlier this week, and he really pointed something out to me, and he said, you are a process guy, you like processes, I do. Um, the more I think about it, the more I realize it, he is right. Um, and so... Maple syrup, part of the reason why I liked it so much um, is because it is a process. And so we're going to talk maple syrup today, much like we talked blacksmithing. And we talked a few podcasts back, we talked about blacksmithing, the art of blacksmithing, the fact that Steph and I took a blacksmithing class. Um, I loved that as well uh, for different reasons, probably. Um, I, but again, the point, one of the big takeaways from that was, man, that is really a process. And that process that it takes to do blacksmithing requires lots of skills. Um, some are mechanical, some are like lifestyle skills. Patience um, is one of them. The understanding that things can't get done real quickly. The thing, understanding that things are connected to each other um, and interwoven constantly. Well, that was the point of the blacksmithing podcast. Well, this is, we're talking make, 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 making maple syrup, and I have never done it before. And I we, we posted a lot of it. I shared quite a bit of it on our Instagram, mostly on Instagram story, but we posted some stuff on Instagram. We posted some stuff on Facebook. We, we shared some of the jars of maple syrup at the end of the weekend. We shared some of the process um, of actually making it, a lot on our story, more so than our posts. But... Um, so I want to share the back end of it. So I've never met, never done it before. This is the first year we ever did it. And I think that was surprising to some people. I think some people, you know, we got a lot of, actually a lot of people reached out about it and were, this, thought, thought it was cool. They, they did it themselves. We shared stuff back and forth, but, uh, which was surprising to me. Um, but, and I'll get into that a little bit more, but one of the things that we, you want the dogs on? Oh, my wife is taking the babies for a walk, and we're going to let the dogs go outside. Go on, Ellie. Ellie, go on. Taylor. Taylor, go on. So as those guys move out, we'll keep going. But So the, the, the idea of maple syrup, making maple syrup, is something I wanted to do for a long time. Um, 
but I never really knew much about it. I knew a lot, a lot of people did it. I thought a lot of people did it just based on observations. Driving down the road in the spring and you see blue bags on trees and you see buckets on the, in the snow and you see, you know, you hear about it, you see about it. I love maple syrup, like the actual product itself. Um, but quite honestly, up until that a few years ago, I, I never had real maple syrup. Um, Steph, when Steph and I um, got started dating and, and living together and eventually married, um, she is into healthier stuff than I am. And she said, no, oh, you know, they can't have that syrup. It's high fructose corn syrup and it's not, you know, you gotta have real and whatever. And I thought, and when I first tried it, you know, I wasn't real crazy about it. I thought, I'm so used to log cabin and Aunt Jemima. This is such a difference. And it is, it is different. It's a different flavor. It's a different texture. It's a different consistency. Um, but as I, as, and, and she just made the decision that we are going to have real maple syrup in her house. So I got used to it. I actually started to like it more. I preferred it. Um, and so that was like, okay, now I realize there is a difference in it. But I, that was it. I didn't really know much more about it. I knew other people made it because of seeing other people make it. And didn't have any idea that people made it to the degree that they make it. I had no idea of what goes into it. I knew there was, you tap the sap and you cook it down and all of a sudden you got syrup. But that was the amount of detail I understood. Well, that got me thinking. And then I went, man, I think that'd be kind of cool to do. I had no means of doing it. I didn't have maple trees. Um, but so I, the steps that it would have taken me to do it myself were greater than what I wanted to overcome. So I decided, you know what, we'll buy real maple syrup instead of buying log cabin. And that was the extent of it. Well, recently, this last winter, um, well, last, I shouldn't say that, it was last some, late, some, late last summer, early fall, um, my parents purchased a cabin on some land on a lake up near their house. And we went up there and we grouse hunted there quite a bit this last fall. If you follow along with us, you'll know that we did some, quite a bit of grouse hunting this last fall. We kind of used that as our base camp and, and there's acreage that goes with it. And I noticed in the fall, man, really pretty colors. Uh, everyone knows that the colors come from maples. So sugar maples especially, right? So I, I saw the colors and I went, man, there's a different dynamic of trees on this property than what I'm used to. Not used to having maples that close and I see them when I'm driving around but I don't really look at them that much other than the color. I didn't really notice them except for in the fall when there was color. Well, so I start, I had that in the back of my head and I said, well now there's a property here that has maples on it. Hmm, you know, maple, maple syrup. Back of my mind. Well, this winter I listened to a book um, on Daniel Boone, a biography on Daniel Boone, it was great. Um, and I found in that biography, one of the things that Daniel Boone and his family did was they made maple syrup and they made maple sugar. So they were in Kentucky, they were settling this, all kinds of great stories about him. But one of the things, one of their main means of income at certain points in their lives was making sugar. And they did it by tapping maple trees and they made maple syrup. And so that was like the point that I said, I'm gonna do it. I just wanna do it. I like Daniel Boone, I think Daniel Boone's really cool. I like his sto the stories, um, he was fascinating to me. And I said, you know what, I'm doing it. We've got trees now, let's do it. So I talked to Steph about it and I mentioned it to her and I said, I'm thinking about doing it this spring. And she said, she kind of laughed and said, okay. And by, by God, I'm, uh, that was in December I told her that. Well, Christmas came and I got a maple syrup starter kit from my wife and family. 10 taps, 10 little hoses, a little booklet, and a filter. And so I said, well, there we go, we're, we're in business. Now I started studying it. I went on YouTube and I watched like, I started out watching like short little segments about making maple syrup. And then I got into more of them, deeper ones, longer ones, documentary type stuff where these guys were talking about making maple syrup and they were all pretty similar but they were in more depth than what I knew based on driving down the road and seeing the stuff. I was getting a better inside look of it. So then I was like getting jacked up and yes, I'm definitely gonna do it. Well, 10 taps wasn't gonna be enough for me. I had to go to the store, I bought 24 more. Or yeah, 24 more. So I ended up with 34 taps this year, which was plenty, which was enough. Bought some hoes, bought some tools. All the tools and information that I got was from these YouTube videos that I watched. 
So I did that. I talked with some people that I knew made maple syrup. I went to the high school who we work with because the high school, I figured I gotta have a way to cook this stuff down. I knew how I was gonna get the syrup or get the sap. Now I gotta figure out how to cook it down. I went to the high school. We work with the local high school uh, for Licking Stick. Hodig Licking Stick is another brand of ours. They weld all of our steaks. We, we make welded rebar steaks for anchoring it down. So we work with the local high school, their shop class, and we pay them and they earn tuition money by helping us fabricate stuff. So we feel good about it, they feel good about it. It's a great relationship. We've built all of our prototypes through the high school. Um, we just, I love working with them. Well, the shop teacher, professor, I call him, he makes maple syrup. Well, the automotives professor makes maple syrup. He's also a good friend of mine. So I started talking to those guys about it and I said, well, how can I cook this stuff down? Well, Mac, uh, Professor Max says, well, we build these, you know, we build some cookers. Uh, we built sap cookers. My buddy that's the auto guy, he had a sap cooker built by the high school. So I said, I want one. So we went through it. I sat down with the kids. We designed it. We got the size that we wanted. They built me this cooker. Now it's like, now I'm serious into this. I got a wood stove. I got a stainless steel pan. I got all this stuff. I'm looking pretty serious at this point. And I am getting real jacked up about it. So weather starts to change for us. It's starting to warm up. We know that this is going to happen. So I went up north and I tapped the trees for the first time. And I had never done it before, but I had watched all these people do it on YouTube and I went, well, that's easy. I can see how this thing is easy. So I went up north and I started tapping trees. And some of them had a little bit of sap. Some of them didn't have much sap. It was, I couldn't, I wasn't sure if I was doing it right. I was, all of a sudden I'm put in the position of now here's the drill and the tools and here's the trees go to work. And I'm going, Jesus, man, I better study this a little bit more. I ended up, I did my best. I tapped, I tapped the trees while I was there. I pounded them in. I wasn't sure if I was tapping them deep enough, driving the taps in long enough. My taps are different than everybody's on TV. I had plastic ones. They were metal, all this stuff. And I'm going, all these little questions are coming up. So I'm reaching out to my buddy and texting him and trying to get informa best information I can. Well, the, the sap is not running at that point. It's still too cold and I'm going, I don't know if I got it right. But you gotta get, you, at some point you gotta just do it. So week one, I tapped it. My dad, ch I, I don't know, I'm hearing stories. These guys are getting five gallons a day out of these trees and I'm going, oh my God, I live two and a half hours away. I got five gallon bucket setups. I'm gonna have need, need someone to check them. So my dad who lives there, he's willing to help me out. So, and, and I'm kind of excited because now this fam, we're gonna have our family involved with it. So he goes and checks them for me two days later. There's a few gallons, but not much. 30 some buckets and a few gallons. So I said, well, you know, it's cold. The guys down here by, by my house here, two and a half hours south are getting all kinds of sap. And I'm going, I either did it wrong or it's too early. And I talked to him and he said, well, you know, it should be running probably better than that. And so go back up the next weekend and some of them had sap and some of them didn't. And so I said, well, I'm going to try a couple other trees. Well, I found a couple other trees and by God, I figure out if I tap the right, a different side of the tree, it warms up a little earlier and all of a sudden it comes out better. Oh, okay. So I, I pulled some out that were dry and not running and I moved them. I said, well, I'm going to, I'm going to find sap on every tree that I, before I'm not putting a tap in it because it was warmer that weekend. So it was running a little bit. So I decided that's what I'm gonna do. So I found trees that, and I moved, and I, I put them on different trees, and every, set, every one that I left that weekend was running. I was getting sap out of them. Not a lot, but I was getting some. Now you gotta keep in mind, this whole thing about ma making maple syrup is it's a short window of time. You might have a week or two, depending on the season. It's all driven by weather. And so I'm learning all this stuff about barometric pressure and how this impacts the cold and warm impacts the tree's desire to push the sap from the base or the, the roots out to the branches to help energize this tree and bring it back to life. It's the blood of the tree. So when it's cold, it pushes the sap down into the, the roots. When it's warm, it runs up the tree and goes out the branches and out to the, out to the tips where the leaves are gonna be. And so in the, in the spring, after this winter, all the sap's been driven down into the base. Well, there's sugar content there. The highest sugar content is driven down. It's the first sap that comes out because it's so concentrated and it's at the base. So you want the first sap. You want to get that first sap. And then you got a short window until the tree buds out. So if it stays warm 
too long and doesn't go back to cold, the tree says, well, it's spring, it's time to bud. As soon as it buds, you can't make syrup out of it anymore. It doesn't, it's not gonna taste right, the sugar content's super low, and it's not gonna run. So it, you need this constant change, cold to warm, cold to warm. It has to be within a 24 hour window. So there's all these variables that I'm going, holy, I had no idea all this stuff was so important. Tap the tree on the right side of the tree, it warms up quicker, you get more sap because it's gonna start running earlier. I found that a lot of times my lines were freezing. Well, it took half the day for the lines to unfreeze. And once, once if there's no free flowing, that sap doesn't, doesn't push. There's no pressure on it, so it's just gravity feeding out of this tree. So all these little things, I'm going, my God, this makes a huge difference. This simple little thing about making syrup all of a sudden has some complexity to it. And until nobody talked about that on YouTube, nobody shared that stuff about YouTube to the degree that I needed to know. The only way I figured that out was getting my hands dirty and figuring, realizing I did it wrong or I did it right. And the ones that I did it right were by luck and it worked. And so I went, how can I replicate that? How can I do that again? So then I made some adjustments. I moved, I moved taps, I moved, I, I did different stuff. Here's another thing, it's as simple as it. So one week of collecting, I went up to every bucket, I, un I pulled my hose out of it, I brought the bucket down to my sled, I dumped it into a tub, and then I brought the bucket back up. And I went, I did that 30 some times, and it took me an hour and a half to do it all. Because by the time I moved around, got all those buckets, that was it. So then I realized, but some of these buckets had an inch of sap in the bottom of them. They didn't have very much. But I made a trip every time, and I thought, well, this, that's, not, that's not the best way to do it. So what did I do? Nobody showed this in the YouTube. They should have. It's simple. They probably would have done it and been, uh, I'm not going to oversimplify this. People think, you know, I'm talking down to them. Here's the thing. If you've never done it, you've never done it. So if you, I went and I started bringing a bucket with me. And then instead of pulling the line, the little drop line out of the bucket, because then I had to put it back into the bucket, I would just tip the bucket with the drop line in into my other bucket and then I'd go to the next one, tip the, and you're probably sitting there thinking right now, if you've ever made maple syrup, you're probably thinking, well, no, sh no shit. Why wouldn't you do it that way? Well, I'll tell you what, if you don't do it, don't realize that it's taking longer than it should, you don't make adjustments. You have to experience it to get good at it. So if you've never made maple syrup and you're thinking about doing it, here, I'll, I'll dumb it down. I'll show you the, the absolute simplest things. I found out, that, oh, I'll, I'll get to that, I'm, I'll get off on a tangent now because there were all these little things I was doing that just didn't make sense. But it's because I hadn't done it before. And so now I get a little more efficient with my collection and I get to the point where I start cooking it. Well, I, the first week I cooked it and I didn't quite have the tools. I had the, I had the stove, but I didn't have a stove pipe. And I wasn't gonna run to the store because minimal trips to society. This is when this whole thing started. So I go, well, I'll cook without it. So I cooked without it. So firewood, here's another thing. You really gotta have the right firewood. I found this out the hard way. So I had a bunch of firewood there that wasn't real dry. I had some that was dry, but I had some that wasn't dry. And I realized burning the wet wood was the crap wood that I thought, perfect, I'll use this for cooking sap. I couldn't get the hot fire hot enough to get a good boil. I also took my pan and I filled it with sap. So I could put about 20 to 22 gallons of sap into my pan. And that's what I did. I poured it in there, ice cold, a lot of, it was full of chunks of ice. I put it all in the big pan and I thought, get the fire going and boil it down. Because every person I talked to said, you just get that fire as hot as you can. Just get it as hot as you can, keep it as hot as you can, boil it down, be careful towards the end because you'll lose it and you'll burn it. So you gotta, you pour it off and then you finish it in the house. That's what everybody tells me. So I went, well, that's simple enough, I'll do that. So I get the pan, I fill it with sap, I start the fire. I try to get the fire hotter. Man, it took, it took hours before I got the thing hot enough to start steaming. And I realized, well, geez, I put 22 gallons of ice cold sap in there and I'm trying to warm it up all at once. So I watched this one YouTube after the second week of doing that. I watched this YouTube video where the guy said, the best way to do it is a little bit of sap at a time. Get it hot, get it boiling, and then add another little bit to it and another little bit to it. He said, you'll use less firewood that way. I said, wow, 
I'm gonna try that. Well, after the first week with wet wood, it took, I mean, it took me a long time to do this, way longer than it should have. It takes a long time to begin with, even if you're doing it well. But it took me a super long time to do this, so to boil it all down. So I, I the second week, I had dry firewood. Oh my God, what a difference. I mean, you put dry firewood in there and it is a thousand times hotter and faster and everything. So I slowly added a little bit of wet wood and a little bit of dry wood and I kind of split it up. Well, that worked pretty good. But I, the second time I boiled all the sap at once again and it took me a long time because of it. So the third week I decided I'm gonna go five gallons at a time. I actually put about 10 gallons in to start because that covered my pan and then I would add five gallons at a time. And it went so much better so much more efficient, so much, but it was because I watched this one guy, I got deeper and deeper and deeper into this YouTube following, watching more and more people talk about their syrup and how they make it, and I picked up a new thing out of every video. It, none of them were earth shattering and changed my outlook on maple syrup, but each one of them had a little bit of a twist that I tried. Some of it worked better for me and some of it didn't work as good for me, but it all had to do with my setup and probably how I wanted to do it. I, so I ended up, in the first week I realized, I, I started making this syrup, and I realized real quickly that when you're making it, you don't go up there with a list of 50 things to get done at the cabin, because you're making maple syrup, and if you want the maple syrup to turn out, you better concentrate on making maple syrup. The first time I went up there, I had a list. I was gonna burn brush, I was gonna trim trees, I was gonna cut firewood, I was going to um, move some firewood, I was gonna do some stuff inside the cabin, I was gonna do train the dogs, I was gonna do all these different things throughout the day while the syrup was cooking. Actually, that's a lie. The second week I was gonna do that. The first week I went up there, I sat and drank beer. <laughs> I drank quite a few beers, I smoked some cigars, I really had, because my buddy told me, he said, it's just the best. You don't do anything but cook syrup. You just relax, you put some music on. Oh man, it was, Ben, you loved it. <laughs> and I did that. And I did that for the first, that first time and I went, man, after 12 hours of doing this, you end up with half a buzz on because you go, geez, I didn't realize it was gonna take me this long. So that was what I did the first week. Well, the second week I said, I woke up with a little bit of a headache and I went, I don't wanna do that again, you know? So the second week I said, I'm gonna get a bunch of stuff done. So I decided I'm gonna work on stuff. Well, the second week, I had warm, I had hotter wood, I had better wood. The first week I was able to get, you know, I, I just stood there around and, and watched. The second week I said I'm gonna be efficient and get a bunch of other stuff done. And so my, my wood was burning hotter. I had to keep an eye on it a little bit more. I had to keep loading the wood in the fire. I had to do all these different things connected to work maple syrup and I got frustrated because I'd get into going and trimming a tree, I'd get into going to work the dogs, I'd get into trying to get this brush pile burning. I had a wet brush pile I'm trying to burn. So what am I trying to do? I'm trying to build a little fire underneath it. And I'm trying to do seven things at once and none of them are turning out. And I'm just getting pissed and I'm getting frustrated and the weather's not the best. And So finally I realized I better give up on trying to get seven things done and focus on getting one done right. And so that was, I, after eight hours of fighting it, that's how I, and, and I ended up making the syrup that weekend and it turned out fine, but it, it took a long time and it wasn't nearly as enjoyable because I got frustrated with the inability to get the rest of the stuff done. So the third week I go, the third week I go up there and I'm getting better at emptying my buckets because I'm, I'm, I'm figuring out more efficient ways of doing it. But I go up, I'm getting more sap too, and it's starting to warm up a little bit, and the things are, the conditions are. I, I wanted so bad to, to do a lot of sap the first weekend, and there was only about 20 gallons to do, thank God, because I, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. So the 20 gallons made a half gallon of syrup, but that was all I could handle. The second week I had about 30 gallons, and quite honestly, that was about all I could handle because I was so distracted by all the other stuff that was I was trying to get done. So I pushed my limits there. The third week I realized I'm not gonna try to get a million things done. I'm gonna get a little system where I'm gonna get my sap going and then I might putz on this for a little bit, get my sap going, putz on that for a little bit. So I had a more realistic system. But what was also happening was I was getting more sap. And so I had, I started to lose the doubt in my system of, man, am I doing this wrong, tapping-wise? No, I was just early. 
And so as bad as I wanted more sap early on, I was blessed with not getting it because I wouldn't have been able to handle it. When I did start to get more sap, it was reassuring to say, you know what, you weren't doing anything wrong. You just had to wait for nature to take place. It needed to warm up. And so a lot of the stuff I was doing was fine. It just wasn't ready. It needed time. So the third week I go up there and I got a better plan. I'm more efficient on collecting the sap. I'm more, I got better wood. I'm more efficient on cooking the sap. I understand what the hell it takes to pour it off and take it off, which is a completely different process that I had never done before. And if you've never done it before, you don't know how to do it. I needed filters. I needed to have this, be able to pour stuff in. I got a pre-filter before I dump it. I realized I got to pre-filter my sap before I put it in. I want to filter it when it comes out and I want to filter it before I bottle it. That was the system. The first week I filtered it one time when I was done boiling it on the inside stove and I filtered it with one filter before I put it in the bottles and I had all this sand in the bottom of it, sugar sand. There's nothing wrong with it. It just doesn't look that good. But I didn't realize what the hell happened there. I didn't know how or why, and I thought, and I talked with another guy that said, yeah, that happens to me all the time. And I went, well, I don't like that. So then I went online and I found out, well, if you filter it differently, you can eliminate that from the start. So all of a sudden I started filtering it differently the second time, I filtered it different the third time. The second, third, and fourth, and fifth time I had no sand in it whatsoever. It's clean, it's so pure. Oh, I get excited thinking about it. But that first time I just didn't know what I was doing. But I had to make that mistake. So. By the third time, I'm filtering it, I'm cooking it, I'm collecting it, I'm getting a little bit of stuff done outside of the cooking process. Things are going a lot smoother. Fourth week, same thing. Fourth week, the sap's really going because we're getting good weather. Fifth week, the, or no, I'm sorry, the fourth week, that, I only did four weeks, so we did five batches, but the fourth week, the problem was, I expected a bazillion gallons, the problem was it got too warm and the sap didn't run, except for the last day or two that I was there, it ran great. So I realized I got all my stuff in order. I know what I'm doing. And again, it doesn't matter. Nature rules. It, she tells me when the sap's gonna run and when it isn't, no matter whether I want it to or not. So that I learned a lot through this process of making maple syrup. Now, I, Ben and I tasted, I, we, did, we cooked five batches of it today, or this season. We tasted all five of them. And I realized we all have different preferences. Ben and I both have different preferences. They're all five very different. Different in color, different in taste. All five are good, I would say, wouldn't you? Yep. I mean, they're good, they're just different. Mm -hmm. When I tasted that first batch, I thought we had made the best maple syrup in the world. Like, it was a cluster to get it. I mean, it was just a, a, a real, it was silly to get, when I look back on it, I go, why did I do it that way? Why did I do it that way? I didn't know any better. And, and it worked. I mean, we got through it. We made syrup at the end. But I had a taste of it, and my family had a taste of it, and Ben had a taste of it right after we made it. I, I couldn't get enough people to taste it. I wanted everyone to taste it because I was so proud of it. But I thought it was the best. And now after making five batches, I would say of the five, it's probably my least favorite. Wouldn't you say? Yeah. It's a, it's a bold, smoky flavor. It's strong. Yeah. Um, it's, it's because of how we made it. Well, when I start talking about the tools, I, I cooked that first batch without a smokestack because I didn't have one and I wasn't going to go to the store to buy one. So the smoke rolled up and over and went into that sap well, the whole time I cooked it. And remember, I never filtered the, I didn't filter the sap going into it. So I had little, pits, little pieces of wood and bark and whatever. And I don't think it's the worst thing in the world, but I do think it affects the flavor. And then we only filtered it once. And so the process that we used to do it, I think the biggest thing was the smoke, but the process that we used to make that syrup created a different flavor. And when I, when I first tried it, it was the first time I had ever made it. I was so proud of it. I, I, had, I had what, if you're in the dog world, I had kennel blindness. I thought my syrup was the best because it was mine. <laughs> that was it. It had some flaws. Now, was it good? Yeah, it was good, but it wasn't the best but I thought it was. After doing it several times now, I went, I like this one more, I like this one more. And, and some of it has to do with things I could control and some of it had to do with things I couldn't control. But the bottom line is, I had nothing to compare it to in the beginning and I did think it was the best. As I made more of it, I realized 
I'd like to try to influence this syrup to taste a little more like this or that. And the things that I do and put into it can impact that. I think the first dog I ever trained seriously was Remy. That was a, a lab, an American lab of mine. First one I ever trained, I bought her in college. And if you asked me back two or three years into owning her, if you asked me when she was four years old, I'd have said, this is the one of the best dogs I'll ever have. I look back at it now and she was, she was great. She was supernatural. That was, that was her strong point. Uh, despite me, she was excellent. But she was nothing in comparison to the abilities that the dogs that I have now are. It's just at that point in my life and at this point in my life where I have a different standard, I have a different level that I hold it to. It doesn't mean that it wasn't good. It just means that it wasn't as good. It's just I've, I've raised the bar a little bit with expectations and that has come with experience. And so my syrup, some batches aren't gonna be better than others. It all depends, it depends on, what, on a lot of variables. But when I first made one, I thought it was the best. And now I realize after making five, I don't think it was the best. I think I got a little bit better at it. I like to think it had to do with some of the processes we did, but I also think it had to do with some of the things that I couldn't control. The sap itself, the weather itself, the time, all the things that I didn't necessarily control. But, so, when we start to, so that's maple syrup 101. Like I, I could go on about maple syrup forever. We're already 30 minutes into this and we haven't talked about a dog yet. And, but there's, we haven't even touched on the, on the tip. Here's, here's one thing. I pulled my taps out. So week three to week four, I moved taps because I had taps on the other side of the lake and the lake was frozen. And so for week one, two, and three, I pull, I was able to walk across the ice with the sled and get the sap from the other side of the lake. Week four, it, week three, it was getting push. It was pushing it. Steph wouldn't go with me. Like she didn't like the ice. Uh, it was getting soft on the edges and it was getting to be a little, you're breaking through a little bit. So not safe. I wasn't not, no maple syrup is worth it. So <laughs> although I do like maple yeah. syrup, but so I decided, okay, I'm going to pull the taps on the other side of the lake but I'm not gonna give up those taps. I need that sap for next week. So I re-tapped trees because I found way more maples on the side by the cabin. And that's another thing that I'll go off on a tangent on. You don't realize until you get into it what you're looking for. I never realized the number of maples. I ne and the reason is is because I didn't look for them. When my wife bought a new truck, she bought a new, what do you call it, a SUV or whatever, yeah. it's a Traverse, I think, a Chevy Traverse. My wife got one, and not new, but a used one, recently. And I never even recognized that vehicle on the road. I didn't, if you had asked me what a Chevy Traverse is, I wouldn't have been able to point one out. And so she started shopping. She wanted a, a, a SUV kind of like that. Um, and so we, she, uh, searched for them. She put a lot of work into it. She found a really good deal on one, used, bought it. And I looked at it and went, oh, nice truck or nice whatever. And then all of a sudden I started driving down the road and I went, these freaking things are everywhere. There are Chevy Traverses all over. I never recognized a Chevy Traverse prior to it, but I had no reason to, okay? So now all of a sudden my eyes are open to Chevy Traverses and I feel like every other vehicle on the road is one. Now, maple syrup, I start tapping trees. Well, the first time I went to tap trees, I had to make sure it wasn't an oak because I had to really look at the tops. And you got to remember, it's it's dead of winter here and when I'm doing this and there's no leaves, There's you can barely see buds. Uh, it's bark. Different maples have different types of bark. I don't know what I'm... I've never paid attention to a sugar maple versus a silver maple versus a red maple. I've never paid attention hardly to a maple versus an oak. And quite honestly... I was confused when I first started looking. People laughed at me and said, well, you're tapping popples. So I said, no, I'm not. I promise you I'm not. But when I wasn't getting sap, I was really getting concerned. And, and so I went from not necessarily really even distinguishing the difference because I had no reason to, to analyzing what one would make the best potential sap tree. And I learned more about how they grow 
based in like these clusters. I found these old cutovers that have maples while I was walking and I realized, man, these are all maples. These are all regeneration maples. And I realized they're all suckers that are coming off of the root system of an old maple that was logged off. And so now I look at the maples that I'm tapping and I go, man, there's a lot of them that there's two or three trees that come out of the base, but they're big now. And I go, Christ, that was 50 years ago. Those were logged off probably. And that's suckers that came off of it. So I'm getting deep into this, you know, wood aspect of it, forestry aspect of it. My dad laughed at me the other day and he goes, what are you, what are you, you're so into this trees now? I said, it's because I'm consumed by it. I've been thinking about it a lot. You don't think about stuff until you put yourself in a position to have to. It's hard to really get into it from the surface is my point. So I switched taps. So I got went from one side of the lake to the other side of the lake. And I found all these trees that I'd been walking back, back and forth going, oh, there's one, there's one, there's one, there's one. So I had all these, well, I'm not going to leave 10 taps untapped for a week. So I realized, oh, my drill bit, I don't have the right drill here and I don't have the right bit. But I had a different drill with a different bit and I needed 5 sixteenths. I didn't have a 5 sixteenths, I had a quarter. So my little engineering mind goes, well, a quarter is only a sixteenth less. I'll drill it in and then I'll just kind of wiggle it around a little bit, make it a little bit bigger. <laughs> Pound the tap in. So, but then I start looking at my drill bit and I realize my five sixteenth, my, my quarter inch tap is the drill bit is broken. It's still there, but it's only a half, half a bit. Well, the drilling point, the tip is broken off. So I said, well, I still got the, the body of it. So what I'll do is I'll take this other drill bit that I have that is much smaller and I'll drill in with it. It's like an eighth inch. So I'll pre-drill a hole with that try to get it as wide as I can. Then I'll take the quarter inch bit and I'll try to put it in and try to get it widened out enough that I can pound the tap in. So I'm gonna, tr I don't, I'm not going to the store to buy a 5 16 So I tried doing that and that didn't work worth shit. I mean, it just was awful. I got holes, I pounded them in. I, I got some sap out of a few. But then when I was pulling these taps, cause I pulled the taps last weekend. When I pulled the taps out, some of these buckets I wasn't getting sap out of. Some of the other buckets that had been tapped from week one, I was getting very little sap out of. And I thought, man, I'm surprised that I'm not getting more, but I'm getting some, so I'm gonna leave them. When I, pound, when I pulled them out, I realized some of my drillings, especially on these latest ones, I, they weren't drilled deep enough and big enough. And when, as I pounded the tap in, it just pinched the tip of the tap. And so it was just a tiny, tiny little pinhole that the sap was allowed to go in. Some of them had wood chunks stuck in it. As I pulled all of these taps, I realized I had done that with a few of them. And so some of these ones that weren't producing, because I didn't check them after a week of not producing, I should have just pulled them out and looked and said, oh, I crunched the tip on it. So I got to either re-drill that or open that up a little bit more or do something to open up. So that was a real fundamental error on my part that I made this season and it cost me sap all year. But I learned from it and I'll never do it again. So sometimes, even if someone tells you, I read about, I watched on YouTube, drill at an angle, drill up at an inch and a half to two inches, to pound this tap in slightly, yada, yada. I read all about it and I felt like there is no way I can screw this up. But I did, I did make the mistake. I did screw it up. I did have it so that it wasn't operating well and I'll never do and I'm not afraid now to pound it in and pull it back out and go oh it held the shape it didn't change the tip it should be good that's a little little tip that I'm going to be no one will tell you to do that because it's probably too common sensey and basic you know how many times I tell people stuff when it comes to dogs? now I'm going to start talking about dogs you know how many times I tell people about common sense simple stuff with dogs that they go never really thought of that it's because unless you experience it and make the mistakes and recognize it, you don't realize it. So I told you a lot about syrup and now I wanna tell you why. It's no different than the blacksmithing. Like my blacksmithing story was about blacksmithing kind of, but everything I do because dogs are such an important part of my life and such a key role and so we, we, I, I'm constantly making analogies with everything I do outside of dogs two dogs because I do think that there are so much there's so much connection and crossover to it. So I would be a person who doesn't have much experience or understanding about dog training, only it's maple syrup. 
And so what do we do? We go and we YouTube, we try to learn as much as we can. We, de we dip our toe in the water and we see how it goes. We make a bunch of mistakes, we learn from it. I'm telling you right now, I am not a master maple syrup maker. Not after five cookings. But I am way better at it now and way more comfortable with it. I think that's the other thing. I was intimidated by a lot of it. And after doing it a few times, I realized what to be worried about and what not to be worried about. Some of the stuff I was worried about, I never, never became an issue. Some of the stuff I had no idea was even going to happen are the things I worry about now. And I'm conscious of and making a point of figuring out, thinking about in the off season, how am I going to get better for it next year? So dogs are the same way in so many respects. And so, especially if you're a DIY dog trainer, if you're at home and you're doing this on your own, you're not looking to send your dog off. You want to do it yourself. I hope we're becoming a YouTube resource for you. I hope we're like that guy that I watched up in northern Minnesota, northern Michigan, Canada, Vermont, Maine. I watched from these maple syrup makers from all across the country that have these different channels and they all have a little bit unique aspects to offer. I took a tip or two out of each video that made sense and I applied. Some of it was a lot of repeat stuff. But I'm hoping that I can, that we can be a help similar when it comes to stuff like our YouTube channel, like our Facebook and Instagram stuff, like our videos, our training videos. If there was a, I'm, there probably are videos out there on making maple syrup, I might buy one. Well, we've got these videos on training dogs and the import, the value of it is, is because I hope it's a tool that's going to help you with your dog. So the connection and the, 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 the similarities are strikingly they're really bold because I just think that there's big things that you take away from it. First off, you don't control the timing all the time with your dog. When I say the timing, I mean the maturing factor. I, as bad as I wanted sap in February, I wasn't getting it there. And the reason I wanted to get it there was because everybody here was getting it. There were guys down here collecting and cooking sap weeks before the sap even ran up by my home, by my cabin. How come? Because it just wasn't ready up there. So if you're at home, I, I got a message today from a guy that's got a, I'm really proud of him. He's got a 14 month old dog that he's part of a retriever club and everyone at the retriever club is e-collars and everyone at the retriever club is further along than he is at 14 months. And he said, you know what, I'm not too worried about that. I've heard you talk about that before and I'm seeing it. It is taking me a little bit longer, but I'm, more, I'm, I'm really happy with what I'm getting out of it. I'm really happy with the process that it's taken. And we talked about, he had some specific questions and I gave him some specific answers according to it. But because my buddies were making syrup down here, didn't mean that I could make syrup up there. Not until the time was right. Now, I think sometimes my dogs do things quicker and sometimes they do things slower than other people's dogs. And it doesn't really matter in the end. Because I got a couple gallons of syrup and they got a couple gallons of syrup. And you know what? I still could be collecting sap up there right now. They, they're not. They're done here. So as nice as it is to be the first one, it's also a little disappointing to be the to be the first one because you're the the next guy's still having the fun. The next guy's it's not always the best to be done first. I don't think. And when it comes to the dogs, I think the race or the rush oftentimes gets us into trouble. When we push too fast, too quick, too far, we dig ourselves into holes. When you dig yourself into a hole, you have one way of getting out and that's not digging your way out. Try it. You'll never be able to dig yourself out of a hole. You can't do it. So I think the process of this syrup making and the process of raising these dogs has so many similarities. I can't get 50 things done at once when I go to make syrup. I got I to gotta concentrate on one thing at a time. And after I got pretty good, better, I shouldn't say pretty good, but after I got better at it and I knew my system and I knew how I was going to do it, at that point, I was able to start adding a few more things. 
and and I think as I get better and better and better at it going forward, and the only way I'm going to get better and better and better at it going forward is by doing it more often. The problem with this is you've got a limited time to do it. You can't practice making syrup all year long. You can you know, you just got this short window to do it. So the nice part about dogs is it's not a window of learning. I think there's a bigger open window early on that helps make your life easier later on if you take advantage of it. That's the first, say, 10 to 12 months. I also think that if you put it off, you'd make it a lot more challenging for yourself when 10 to 12 months goes past and now you decide, hey, I want to start training my dog. You got 10 to 12 months of habits and those habits are probably going to be a lot of undesirables. And it takes longer to reverse habits that are undesirable than it does to form the right ones in the first place. Now, will, does that mean you won't make mistakes in your training? Not at all. I make a ton of them. I still make a ton of them. And I adjust from each one. But I will say, in the big picture, I make less today than I made in the past. And I make different ones today than I made in the past. Because I've learned from some of those mistakes in the past. And I don't repeat them. I learned making maple syrup. I'm going to be a lot more prepared next year with dry firewood. And that will help me greatly and things will go a lot easier. I learned that next year I want to have a warmer. I want to have a little tank that I can warm the syrup in prior to dumping it in so that I will pour warm syrup, warm sap in instead of cold sap. I learned by week three and four, don't dump 22 gallons in to start out with. Start with 10 and add five at a time. So I started getting to understand it a little better. And the more I do it, the more I'll understand it. It's just the way it's going to be. So, oh, that's it, man. That was a deep maple syrup conversation. I, I'm telling you, here's the other thing about it was my buddy called, you know, brought that up about processes and how much I enjoy it. This was the other reason I'm going to make maple syrup and I look forward to it and I'll be better off for it. I enjoyed it a lot. I had a great time doing it, which is why I'm going to do it again. Now, Steph enjoyed it, but after the, I mean, I cooked it this week. I cooked it till midnight on Monday night. On the weekend, I was up till two in the morning doing it. I mean, it got, it got to be, by the end of the, Wild. by the end of the cooking, yeah, I was a nut, man. I was <laughs> real nuts about it. I, by the end of it, I got to the point where I said, that's it. I, I've done this enough. But then by the time I got done and I tasted the syrup, I went, I got to do this again. This was fun. It, it becomes a bit of a grind when you're in hour number eight of watching it boil. In hour number 12 of fin trying to finish it on the stove. You can't speed that up either. You can only boil it off so fast. Once you get it going, it's, you can only get it going so fast. So at certain points, you're frustrated and you go, huh, maybe this is enough. But for whatever reason, when you get done and you taste it and you go, that one. That was awesome. I'm doing it again. I will make maple syrup again for sure. And the reason is, is because I really enjoyed it. If you don't enjoy training your dog, you're not going to do it. If I didn't enjoy making, making maple syrup, the taps would have been pulled after week one. Because I just said, that's enough. If you don't fi figure out and in, in, get into the mindset that this is actually supposed to be fun... Training that dog, raising that dog is going to become a lot of work. And if it's not rewarding work, you're not going to do it. Why would you? So you got to, you got to, you have to get to the mindset where you go, if it's not fun, how come? Is there something I should be doing different? I really think that's important. It goes back to a message David Latham sent me when I was talking to him about Bailey or, uh, his dog Bailey, but Bella's dad. And I was telling him how much I was having fun with Bella. And I really am. And I was telling, we were talking back and forth on it. And he said, you know, the reason you're having so much, the reason you're having so much success is because you're really enjoying it. And I thought, that's terribly simple. Why didn't I think of that? I never thought about it that way, but he was absolutely right. The reason, a big reason I'm having the success I'm having with her is because I look forward to every day of working with her. 
and I don't work there every day, but I wish, every day I wish I could. Well, that alone makes it a lot easier to get out and do the work. And it, you won't get the results without the work. So all this stuff is connected. It's a big circle. Um, I hate to get real deep on it, but it, it doesn't, shouldn't, I guess it doesn't necessarily need to be real deep. But everything we do is connected. It, you can impact stuff, you know, outside of dog world. You can impact, we can impact what's going on right now. Right now, what's going on right now is a mess. And I could tell you all sorts of things that, that, that are just terrible about what's going on right now. But I also can tell you a lot of things that are going on right now that are really good. And I'll tell you right now where my focus is, is not on the stuff that's really bad. I don't think you can bury your head in the sand. I think you have to be realistic and aware. But I think you also have to have good perspective. And the amount of stuff right now that's going on that is good, positive, solid, outweighs the negative. I think that's life again. The good will outweigh the bad. And, and I do think you have to recognize, understand, and acknowledge that just as much. It's your choice. If you want it to be half full or half empty, it's your choice. I don't, we don't need to go any more into that, but I just, I think it's, I think that the connection between the out, your outlook on things is really, really important. And now is, is there's never been a better time for it to be an example and, and, and be realistic in, in every one of our lives right now. You have that choice. I challenge you to make it positive. I challenge you to make it contagious. You know, contagious right now is a really big, big buzzword. You know, how quickly can things spread? How contagious are things? I, I challenge you to be extremely contagious right now. Be spread things that are positive. It's our hope with doing these. It's our hope with the content stuff that we're putting out on YouTube right now. Um, it just, I just, there's, a couple different partners, Michigan Buckpole we, has reached out to us. We're going to team up with them on Thursday. That's tomorrow. When's this podcast going to go? Tomorrow. Okay, so it's going to go live tomorrow? Tomorrow morning. So we're going to get this thing live tomorrow morning. When you listen to this, if you're listening to it the day we launched it, Thursday the 9th, I think it is, mm -hmm. we're going live on Michigan Buckpole, and that is going to be uh, on their Facebook and Instagram pages, and we're going to be on ours as well, yep. live, and Ben's going to stay late with me and help me, and we're just going to do question and answer. Well, we can talk about anything you want. Shed training is going to be the focus, but we can talk about anything else you want. Um, I'm talking with another uh, great company that has reached out to us, and we, we're, we're looking at doing some things together. Um, we're looking at working together with them to bring more content, easier ways to share stuff. Um, ben and I have a conference call with another guy later this afternoon. We've got an idea where we said, what if we did this? We're going to try to do, we're going to line some of that stuff up. So I don't, I, we're going to get, I don't want to get into a lot of detail on any of it yet because none of it is for sure, but we are working on, it's literally our mission right now is what's the best way for us to help the current situation? And the answer always comes back to let's help people. I can't help you with math. I can't help you with homeschooling. I can't help you with your job. I can't help you with, what I can help you with is hopefully develop a better relationship with your dog. That's what we do, and that's what we're trying to do. So that's what we're focusing on and controlling what we can control and the stuff we can't control, having faith that it's going to work out. That's another thing. You know, this is a really good opportunity these times for us um, to really lean on our faith. And, and I don't care what your faith is. I hope you have something. Uh, I've got a lot of faith uh, in, in it's. I have a lot of faith in it's gonna. We're gonna get through this. We're gonna get through this. And I don't think it's a quint. I, you know, I, I am a, I, I, you know, I'm a, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. I, I'm not afraid to say it. Um, and I have, you know, it's Easter. I don't think it's a weird. I don't think it's a coincidence that Easter's coming up this weekend. I don't think it's a coincidence that things are looking better. We had some pretty grim, grim weeks here. Things are better. Things are gonna get better. So I think you gotta lean on that right now. We're trying to do our best to help with what we can help with. So that's it, longer podcast than normal.
didn't quite get to an hour, so mm -hmm. I did well there. Uh, I hope you guys, I hope you guys, if nothing else from this podcast, take away an interest in real maple syrup versus high fructose corn syrup. That stuff is terrible for you. <laughs> you got to get out of it. You got to get away from it. Steph is, I'm a, re, I'm a label, label reader. Don't be drinking the high fructose corn syrup. Get some real stuff. All right. We'll talk with you guys later. <laughs>